Hello and good morning and welcome to New Forest Morphs. I hope you all had a lovely weekend and enjoyed some snake time. Jared and I certainly uh, had a great weekend and it's good to be back. Um, this week we're focusing on the RI issues, which is the respiratory infections. In actual fact, it's actually called respir respiratory tract infections. It should be called RTI, but we often refer to it as RI. And there are like two levels to this. You get a bacteria form, which is less easier to treat and you get the second form which is viral and that's virtually impossible to treat but there are things that you can do and um, we'll, we're going to cover the bacterial side for the first part of the week and then we're going to discuss the various viruses that are out there which are effectively deadly and uh, fortunately the viral sides are less common than the bacterial side and most of us will be experiencing at some point in our snake keeping uh, the exposure to um, the bacterial side and the only way to really know whether your snake's got a bacterial or a virus is to actually take it to a vet and I always say if you get any issues with RI the first thing is to take it to the vet get them to do a diagnostics I mean we had a snake that was in our quarantine that started to show um, signs of uh, issues arising on the respirational front and fortunately for us it was in our uh, quarantine and the guy that sold us the snake and I won't give you his name away I reckon he palmed it off us, one of these cowboy flippers out there. So fortunately we had our quarantine and the other thing, I suppose the only blessing I think that was good about that is that we decided to create a hospital on top of our quarantine. So we've got the quarantine for new arrivals and then if the quarantine has anything in there that's an issue, like one of them, at one point we had six snakes in our quarantine and that one that came could have infected the other five. So I said to Jared, what we've got to do is we've got to move that into a hospital area straight away. And we created our hospital. And that gave rise to our hospital that uh, we can have to use as part of our facility. Now, these are away from the facility and I can't underestimate the importance of keeping things separate because these diseases are, you know, can be contagious. And uh, there's a lot of fallacies out there. A lot of people think that RI is highly contagious. And you'll look at the videos and people are saying highly contagious, highly contagious, highly contagious. But I'm very lucky enough to have access to some top-end professionals who see this issue day in, day out, and they're well experienced. And they actually think that it's overplayed, um, the, 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 um, the effect of the spreading. And I'm going to share something with you um, which will help us understand a bit more. Um, Jared and I, to be honest with you, we're not experts in this, so please, whatever you take from this, take a feel and flavour for our feeling. It isn't gospel. And we're, we're very inexperienced because we've not had a lot of RI issues. So we feel a little bit amateurish, really, to ask you. And so I'm going to be drawing upon others to help us do this. In fact, I'm going to ask you guys to share your thoughts. Because I think it seems to me as they... When I went on the internet, there's very little on RI in terms of videos. A lot of the breeders out there just think it's a taboo subject, don't want to talk about it. And I think it's a wrong approach because what that does, it encourages people to bury it underground and not ex actually talk openly about the issues. And I'm very grateful for two of our subscribers who Kaz and Colin are both fighting um, one of their snakes, their favorite snakes has got an RI, RI issue. So thank you so much Kaz and Colin for, I would say be bold enough to actually say, I've got an issue, can you help? And to me that shows the best way forward is that we've got to be transparent with each other. And certainly if you've got a top breeder that's got an RI issue in its collection. He should be doing several things. He shouldn't be selling snakes, he should be isolating the issue, and he should be contacting anyone he sold a snake to to let them know that an RI issue has arisen subsequent to sell. And that tell that person to keep an eye on the snake in case, in case it has picked it up from the collection. So I think in transparency is so important, and I just hate the fact that people are scared to talk about it. And I think it's a really important, I don't know what your feeling is, Jared, but I think we need to be a lot more open with the real issues of keeping. So you're gonna get a very realistic view from me, and I'm sorry if it does upset anyone in the industry, but I do think that there needs to be a lot more transparency in how we communicate things, so they can reassure, this is what you're probably gonna experience sometime in your life when you take up snake keeping. And if we do that and we study the anatomy, we study how to prevent, back to preventative medicine. So when we do the RI, we're going to cover the usual thing, like we did with the mites, is we're going to obviously discuss what it all means, the definition. We're going to look at the, uh, the um, diagrams. I've got a diagram to show you the anatomy of a snake, which I think is really helpful. If you understand the anatomy, you can then understand the treatments. You can understand the issues, the symptoms. 
So I'm going to go there and I'm going to show you a few diagrams today. Or in fact, this is going to be a RTI week. You know, we're not going to cover everything in one day. So this is going to be split up into probably three or four days of videoing where we're focusing on the RA issues. And then next week, we're going to talk about how to build a facility and how to get the costing and the best approach, uh, what we did, share our experiences. And I hope you enjoy and look forward to that. And again, these, these topics are all driven by you guys out there. We're listening very carefully to your comments. So your comments are very, very important to us. But before we get into the RI, let's have a look at some snakes. And Jack, I, I, Jack doesn't know what I've been doing over the weekend. I think because he'd been spending time with your family and I've been kind of looking after the snakes over the weekend, I decided to do an experiment. And I want you to look at this facility as a lab. And we're not scientists, but we're educational people that seek further education and seek further learning. But we can, in a way, treat the whole of our collection as a labor laboratory, with me being the mad professor, and hopefully not a Jack Jackal and Hyde type approach. <laughs> but what are your thoughts on that, Jared? Do you like the idea of actually having our facility as a lab as well? Mm. Or do you think you, you don't want to go there? I wouldn't call it a lab. Okay. lab. Lab makes me think of like animal testing and stuff. I don't agree with that. But um, Yeah, I don't really want I mean, to portray that picture. I mean, when I say lab, is that when an issue arises, that we use the snake to teach us. That, that kind of way. I'm not saying we do animal experimentation to the 11th degree, because I think you've got to really be careful with that. But what I'm saying is that when an issue arises, we seek from our professionals, first of all, the vet, I'm number one, a proper vet. And then secondly, we go to trusted professionals in the industry that have had experience. And I think thirdly, we talk amongst ourselves and discuss the issues of the day, because I think a lot of good ideas come out of people that aren't necessarily full experienced people. You know, I talked about Maradona issue where you've got people that haven't been trained in a straitjacket. These are people that are just going with their own instincts and feelings. Never underestimate the power of an idea from anyone in any organization. And uh, which reminds me of a joke actually, because there was a story told once of a guy that was paid millions of pounds a year just by looking out the window. And Someone else in the organisation found out and spoke to the boss and said, how come he's getting so much money and all he does is look out the window? And his boss said, the very reason that you're here is because that guy came up with an idea that's making this company a fortune. And it took about humility and took about putting him in his spot because and one idea can make a huge difference to humanity. And that will lead me on to leadership. You know, I didn't get a chance to finish the leadership thought. So later, Chad, remind me to finish the leadership thought because I didn't finish that. Let's go and look at some snakes. And the experiment, Jad, was uh, two, I did, I did two experiments. Now, Jad and I have just cleaned everything. And there's three things that we can report back. Now, the first thing we did is over the weekend, I put extra bedding and extra hides in because I felt that some of our snakes were already naturally trying to find hides under the paper. And I'm really pleased with some of the positive results, but I'm going to give you the positive and the negative. So the positive, Jared, what was your, what do you think is the positives of giving extra hides, extra paper for the snakes? Makes them feel more comfortable. Makes them feel more comfortable. And I actually saw a difference in temperament and in color. So, and also behavior. There were three positives to me. Number one, the color of my snakes seemed to enhance because they were happier and more content. So if you want to get more colours out of your snakes, you've got to make them feel happy. A happy animal is a vibrant animal. The second thing I noticed is that some of the snakes, when we went, went and moved them into the rubs, when we're cleaning, some of them want to escape the rub all the time. I mean, I've got a couple. Venus is one of them. I and mean, she just literally is, pick her up, put her in the rubs, and she's, I've got to fight with the lid to, get her, to keep, her in the, keep her in the rub. This time, she was at peace, and she wasn't fighting to get out. Now that leads me on to two boys that have been... Now I've been in here with Jad and I've been in here for nearly six months now, isn't it? In those six months, there's two boys that I thought wanted to breed. You know, I talked about the breeding issues and I thought there's two boys that haven't been put to a girl's and every day I clean them, they want to come out of their rubs. And I thought it was because they're smelling the hormones of the other, the other couples, which I think Rob refers to that as the rhythm of the room. So once you get your pairing, if you've got a lot of animals, best to do them in groups because they create hormones that actually stimulate the whole of the family in the facility. So I thought that the two boys that were gagging for sex were smelling the hormones and thinking, where's that female? Let me get to her. And I think there's something truth in that, but I've just learned something else from the experiment, which is, 
if you make their bedding more comfortable and you adjust the humidity, because when I did the bedding, I sprayed the bedding down a bit more. That gave them a little bit more moisture, a bit more humidity. Their temperament had completely changed the next day from not wanting to get out of their rub at peace with themselves. And I'll just show you what I mean. Like Kylo is one of them. So if I show you Kylo, Kylo every day I take him out and have some time. Now look, he's normally gagging to come out. Look at him now, he's happy. He's tucked into bed. He's created extra water for himself. That was nice and dry about an hour ago. He's basically decided to give himself a bit more moisture. Now, he would normally be jumping to get out of his rub. And that tells me my husbandry was probably wrong. And it isn't necessary about breeding. So I've misread that, possibly. <laughs> but Joe and I try to work it all out. But it's an interesting behavior is that I gave him extra bedding and extra moisture. And look how happy he is. He doesn't want to come out. So if you get a snake that wants to come out, it isn't necessarily sex. He's saying, I don't like my environment. Or I need some time to spend with you. And I've given him lots of time. This is the first time in eight, six, six months that he has not been gagging to come out of the rub. I find it amazing. So please, you know, do be prepared to play around with gut instincts. You may get it right, you may get it wrong. I'm a happy because he's a happy bunny. Now I've got to be careful because the one issue with giving them extra bedding, Jad, which Jad raised, because on the hatchlings we had a different scenario. What was going on with the hatchlings? They were moving that bedding into the water bowl and it was absorbing all the water like a wick. Yeah. And just made everything soaking wet, which can be that's the danger. That's the danger, okay? And there's all good and bad in every approach here. So on the baby front, we found that a lot of the babies were moving their paper onto their water bowls and because I use blitz which is highly absorbent if you've got one little bit of blitz hanging over a water bowl it can drain that water bowl and your snake's sat in wet and they've got too much humidity and that's a bad and no water to drink and no water to drink so there's a bad reason to overdo it so can you see you've got to be on this on the one hand the adults are enjoying it the hatchlings are not enjoying it so much was that true of all the hatchlings or was it just one or two of them oh just a few of them yeah, most of them were probably happy and content. I've had a look at the hatchlings because Jad takes care of that, I take care of the adults. So I've not had an inspection myself and I'm not going to bring out Sergeant Major today, even though I know you'd love me to bring him out. Now then, now then, now then. But um, the other boy that's always coming out who's going to be on our 500 subscribers uh, giveaway. <laughs> this is on our 500 subscriber giveaway. I'm going to show you him. Aladdin always wants to be on his flying carpet. Now let's have a look and see what he wants to do now. He's a lot more at peace. He's not fidgeting. He's not as nervous. And normally you'd want to leave his rub. So his temperament has completely changed since he's got more humidity and more cover. And you can see he's quite wet in there. We may have to address that a little bit. But all I'm saying to you is the temperament of the animals changed from wanting to race out and be outside his rub to being comfortable in his rub. So there's a good indicator, Jeff. So I, I'm delighted with that. And I hopefully gain something from that. It's not gospel. I'm just giving you my real life experiences here. The other thing that Jad and I have discussed is Jad and I have now been cleaning the rubs regularly. And Jad now wears gloves. He didn't wear gloves before. And I convinced him to wear gloves on cleaning, which might be a pain. But Jad, how are you feeling about that? I know I've encouraged you to use gloves. Is that a good thing or are you finding it a bit of a pain in the backside? Bit of a pain, but... Um, Can you it... see the reason for it? It's taking our hygiene up to the next level, yeah? and it will pay dividends. So something that's a hassle, then extra time. I mean, our 15 minute session was half an hour. So we've doubled our cleaning time, but we're protecting our snakes and we're being better at husbandry. So much, much of the time we're all busy. We want to rush through things, we cut corners, but if you cut corners, believe you me, you'll pay for it later, as you'll know, with RI issues and my issues. So it's a little bit of a false economy thinking you can cut corners, take a long-term view. That's a bit on the behavior side. Is there anything on your side, Jad, that you wanted to touch? So what we'll do, we'll go back now to the other part of the video, which is just to give you some feedback on messages. Now, Jared, you had a lovely message um, on Instagram, didn't you? Do you want to share? Wayne's come back to us and he's confirmed his contact details ready for the Wednesday showing. So I'll contact you, Wayne, and we'll do a Zoom and uh, draw upon your experience. But Rob sent us a lovely email, didn't he? Or a nice message. So thank you, Rob, because Rob watches our videos and he really, he says he really enjoys them. But I wanted Jared to just, to, if we may, just read that message because I think it's beneficial to the whole community because he's, he's giving us his wisdom here. And I really appreciate that, Rob. Sure. 
So he said, no, you can't see clear. Do you want me to read it? Sure. Okay, here's my take on your latest video, guys. I guess you guys make a great team. Thank you, Rob. Um, sent and f I'm not very good at the reading, Jad. Do you yeah. want to read it and I'll, yeah. Scent and pheromones are an essential part of the breeding process and in a room full of snakes they can smell each other without even being in contact. A breeder female will always scent her tub in the breeding season so that the males in her area are able to find her. Her instincts drive her to do this. She doesn't know that you're going to be helping her by bringing in the male. When you clean the tub they will drop your rates or poo almost immediately as you put them in their clean tub and I agree with your comment that you don't want to be too clinically clean at this time of year. I clean poo with, uh, I clean poo but will leave your rates in the tubs as long as it's not soggy. Later in the season when they go off food it gets a lot less messy but they still use your rates for scenting and yes they will still breed if you do keep tubs clean. So if you do like to keep things spotless they will still breed. In the actual pairing it's not uncommon for the female to poo within minutes of the male going in. This is her reaction to him being there and is her way of saying, come and get some. So I tend to leave it for the time <laughs> that the male is in there. Yes, it's messy. Yes, it can be a bit aromatic. But for the few days he's in there, it will do no harm. And usually it's a strong indication that she's receptive and you'll get a lock within a few hours. Uh, I clean up immediately. Oh, I clean up immediately when I split them. Invariably, the female will resent her clean tub almost immediately as you clean it. Um, snake sex can get a bit enthusiastic and they will spill full water bowls so the heavier water bowls and not filling them up so much during pairing will reduce the amount of liquids involved in the process. An additional benefit of leaving a tub messy for a day or two while the male is in there. Not only do the two snakes involved in the pairing get turned on by it but the rest of the snakes in the room smell it too. The rhythm of the room. You pair up a bunch of snakes at the same time. The pheromones released in the room gives you a higher rate of lockups than if you pair up your snakes spread over a period of days. Use the scent they produce to your advantage and pair up a bunch of snakes at the same time. Loving the enthusiasm. Oh Rob, that is such gold dust information there that I feel really privileged that you're taking that much care to feed Jared and I with these extra bits of pieces of information and it feels like you're with us Rob. And I really appreciate that as a brother and it's going to make us better keepers I think and I really love having experienced people that's why I'm looking forward to Wayne Wayne he's got 20 years experience and I'm really looking forward to building up a relationship with him because I think he's anyone with that much experience I and mean, these are guys that go back like as long as Billy Rose and you know, mutation creation and we're talking about having a local person or someone c close to us that can give us that kind of information is invaluable and we need to protect and watch out for each other because I think it's so important to listen to each other and to be respectful because some of the top people are going to be a little bit controversial with the mainstream or sometimes they're going to be a little bit controversial with others who've got an opinion and that can involve um, the wrong approach on expression of views. Now you notice on my channel I've had a couple of people that have been a bit silly and I've kind of decided to love them more and I think it's hard because you, you know the natural tendency is uh, to hate a hater, but in actual fact, I've learned from my own spiritual perspective is to love those who despitefully use you and abuse you. It's a great degree of love, and uh, yeah, that's kind of an interesting thought. Well, that wasn't supposed to be my thought for the day. I was going to talk about um, leadership and. I think yesterday I didn't get a chance to finish this because Mandy and I were having problems with the camera and I'm sorry if it all messed up in parts but the quote was on the thought for the day was are leaders born or are they made? What's your view Joe, on that? Definitely made. Definitely made. And why do you say that? Because you can have someone that was born into royalty or whatever they might be but they could be a terrible leader. Yeah. To be a good leader you have to, to learn and grow yourself. And develop leadership skills. Very good, Jared. I'm very proud of you that you have that view. Because if you go to some of these top psychological, uh, not psychological, business behavioural leadership seminars, they teach um, differently. And they, they're, the very question itself actually is incorrect. It's been posed incorrectly. And Stephen Covey, who's I trust him so much, such a great guy, really good motivational leader, 
He said this is a false dichotomy. Do you know what dichotomy means, Chad? No oh, idea. Dichotomy means dichotomy. If you know Latin, dichotomy, it means um, comparing one argument against another. It's like contrasting one against the other. And so to present that as a dichotomy is actually a false principle in its own right. And I think how we lead a question is very important. And leaders are neither born, and according to him, they're, not, they're neither born or made. Leaders choose to be leaders. Now, that seems to be very interesting. Why do you think he's saying they should choose to be leaders, Jared? If you don't want to lead, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. You make it up. I think you're on the right track. You know, you said that leaders are made. They're made by our effort, our own efforts, aren't they? Our own choices. So you're, you're right. And um, you can choose to be a leader or you can choose not to lead. All of us are leaders in some way anyway, because we lead by example. We lead as fathers and mothers, as businessmen. As We're leading. Everything we do, we are setting an example. And anyone that sets an example is a leader in my book. You don't have to be, like you say, royalty or prime minister. You know, you, And that leads me on to the five top leaders that the world recognises. Now, Mahatma Gandhi, and I probably pronounced his first name wrong, apologies for that, it's just part of my dyslexia. Mahatma Gandhi. Now he was renowned, what was he renowned for, Chad? Do you know much about him? Didn't he do like a long fast? He did. He was an activist. Yeah, he was an activist and he was an anti-war activist. But each of these five leaders I share have got weaknesses and they've got problems but they left a legacy for us. And we try to focus on the positive. And I could easily, and I don't want anyone to criticize these five leaders on this channel, but I'm saying that the world recognizes that they are globally accepted as influential leaders. But he was an anti-war activist, activist with a global legacy that we now enjoy. The second one I'm gonna mention is Winston Churchill. Now, if you looked at what happened in World War I and World War II and you contrast them, you'll see that Winston had a learning curve for sure. He made a lot of mistakes and he upset a lot of people. Yet, in our most important time of need in this country, World War II, they needed a leader that would step up to the plate that had a military background and he was like a leader in the Admiral, in the, in the Navy fleet. And <clears throat> he understood strategy, he understood uh, how to lead men. And he was put in a very difficult position. And if anyone hasn't seen it, go and watch some of the films about Winston Churchill. Obviously, some of them are factual, some of them are kind of blown out. But you look at that and see what he actually did. And some of the things he did were awful, but many of them were great. But he's left a legacy that in, for us, a legacy of incredible legacy. Then we take someone like Martin Luther King Jr. Now he was, do you know much about him, Jared? Not that much. Well, he was celebrated as a civil rights activist, okay? And that activa act activist, he has an activist, he's changed the whole of the American... Uh, America has changed completely. We had our first black American president, okay? Now, back in the... You know, if you'd study the history, the American history, it's awful how the black community were treated, enslaved from Africa. Now, we talk about snakes coming from Africa. Uh, a lot of the... Um, people in America were originally from the slave trade, which we shouldn't be proud of because British Empire was part of that. And uh, it created um, in various cultures that blacks were second class people, which is completely wrong because we are all children of God and we are equals in the sight of God. It doesn't matter our race, skin, color, or ethnic background. We are all equals. That's my opinion anyway. And I like the fact that Martin Luther King put his life on the line for his beliefs and his passions and we know that he was martyred and to me he's left a legacy of sacrifice and love true leadership then you move on to someone like Nelson Mandela now Nelson Mandela Jared do you know much about him I mean not big details and then he went to jail and he was um, trying to get freedom for the yeah. black community but yeah, another movie, good movie has been made about him, and again, it doesn't necessarily reflect every aspect of his life, but he had a very colourful upbringing and, you know, very interesting issues going on as he was raising. I think he had a political lawyer background, and he was trying to defend black people from oppression and uh, amongst blacks and whites in, uh, in his country, and he got in a lot of trouble, and um, as a result, he was put in prison, and 
he came out of there and you, we know how much of a great leader he's and the legacy he's left and what's happened to the country. And I, what impressed me is that when he became the president, he could have easily treated people badly, but he actually worked with both communities and worked together and tried to build bridges. A bit like the current president of the United States, he's trying to build bridges right now, the new one, and he's trying to create peace. Now, I don't want this to become a political blog, so everyone's got lots of views out there. Please don't bombard me with lots of opinions on this, but I'm just trying to make a point here is that leaders lead because of their choices, not necessarily because of they've been made king or they've made president. And sometimes you can lead without being a, a global figure. The only, we've only got a couple of minutes, so we're gonna give you part two of the RI, and I'm sorry, Colin and Kaz, I know you're waiting for this, and it's gonna come on the second part, but I just wanna set the tone about leadership because I wanted to share who I believe is the prime example of ultimate leadership. And Jared knows my heart. Who do you think that is, Jared? Me, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Banter's coming, I love Jared's humility. Well, Jared is a good example of him anyway having served, you served the mission for our church, and I have, and we try to follow our saviour, Jesus Christ. He's the only perfect leader I can think of that has never, ever made a mistake in his life. And everything he did was motivated by love, by sacrifice, by service, and by lifting the poor and needy. And if we, doesn't matter what our spiritual views are, if we learn to take the values that he has given us and apply them in our lives, we will become true leaders. So, with that in mind, I think we will now finish with, um, I, think, I think we'll finish there, Jared, because I think we're going to move straight on to part two. Thank you, everyone, for your love and support. We're going to give you guys a shout out. Going to go over the um, feedback. I've had some lovely feedback from Gavin. I've had some lovely feedback from Kevin. I've had some lovely feedback from Steve Barrett, Hamlin. There's all these beautiful views that I'm going to share with you on the second part. Uh, so stay with us please and uh, we'll see you in a second. <laughs>